And Moon Over Monona Terrace is supported by a grant from the Alliant Energy Foundation and in partnership with the Madison Astronomical Society and UW Space Place. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff and Lawrence. Greetings, everyone. Jeff, are you there? Yes, uh, I am. All right, here we go. Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Lawrence Moore. I'm the president of the Madison Astronomical Society. And with me tonight is the president emeritus of the Madison Astronomical Society, Jeff Schockler. And he's going to share with you a very interesting and information packed tour of the moon today. <laughs> Greetings, Jeff. There we go. Thank you, Lawrence. Appreciate that. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our virtual moon over Monona Terrace. It is unfortunate that um, Madison and uh, Chicago are clouded out where we had uh, hoped to be able to provide you with some live uh, moon views tonight. Uh, we do have a uh, an amateur astronomer friend in Kansas, uh, Martin, who um, his skies are clearing. So we think uh, later this uh, evening, uh, we'll be able to do some live views of the moon and Jupiter and Mars if that uh, cloud line clears for him. So what we're going to start with today is a little uh, virtual moon tour that I prepared for you. Uh, the idea here is to give um, you an overview of uh, the moon, to give you a sense of um, its major structures, kind of how to orient yourself on the moon. Uh, we're going to walk through some of the phases of the moon, just not just the first quarter moon that we'll be seeing tonight, hopefully through um, Martin's telescope, um, but really a chance to give you a sense of what's there, what you can look at, some of the structures and features that you can see with the naked eye, but also with binoculars or even with the telescope. So I'm going to start by um, kind of introducing you to the moon, some pretty basic concepts using uh, these images. Um, all the photos that you're going to see, by the way, I took myself through a telescope uh, with a camera attached to it. Um, and I'll be showing a video, a short video as well in a little while, we'll, where we'll do a little bit of a virtual tour uh, across the surface of the moon along the Terminator, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So a few basic concepts about the moon. Um, all of us are pretty familiar looking up into the night sky and we see a beautiful crescent moon like this, the 4.7 day old waxing moon. And one of the things you'll notice, of course, is there's an illuminated side of the moon. And then there's the side of the moon that's in shadow or in darkness. Um, where those two things meet is where things can get very interesting, what's called the terminator. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about how you orient yourself on the moon. So um, in this image, north is up and south is down. And when you're looking at the moon itself, one way you can tell you're looking at the southern hemispheres, the southern uh, hemisphere of the moon is very rough. It's called the southern highlands. It's heavily cratered, mountainous, very, very rough looking surface, whereas the northern hemisphere appears a little bit smoother. So that's a way to know how to orient yourself there. And then just like on a map of the Earth, east in this case would be to the right and west to the left. Um, I mentioned the terminator. That's this line that shapes the crescent, actually, of the moon. Um, in this case, the 4.7 day old moon. Um, this is called the terminator, that point where the illuminated side of the moon uh, kind of meets the shadowed and dark side of the moon. And you can think about if you were standing at the, on the surface of the moon at this location, at the terminator, it would be like dawn or sunset on Earth. So the sun would be very low, virtually on the horizon, and you would have very, very long shadows. So you think about at noon, right? You virtually have no shadow because the moon is overhead. But at dawn or at sunset, you have very strong shadows. And that's what makes observing the moon really interesting as its phases change, is that along the terminator here, where the shadows are very, very stark, you get to see the relief, all of the terrain stands out very prominently because you've got an illuminated side and then the shadowed side. And we'll look at that in more detail in just a second. A couple of things I'd like to call your attention to when you're looking at the moon at a beautiful phase like this um, are things like this. Notice there are points of light on the other side of the terminator in the shadowed part. I'm kind of calling attention to four of those. 
look for those in some of the subsequent uh, images that I'm going to show. And look for them, too, if we get a chance to look through Martin's telescope tonight, when we look at the first quarter moon and kind of fly along the Terminator, keep an eye out for these points of light. What these are, actually, are the tops of mountains or the um, edges of craters that have been lifted up above uh, the surrounding surface. And remember, along the Terminator is essentially like dawn. So if you've ever been to the front range of the Rocky Mountains at dawn, and you're standing there and the sun is coming up, the first things that get illuminated, that get lit up, that come out of, um, out of the darkness are the tops of the mountains. And that's what we're seeing here. These are mountain peaks, in this case, these little dots that are illuminated by this really low angled sun that's here at dawn along the Terminator. And this is the edge, the rim of a crater, a very prominent crater um, that is showing up there. So keep an eye out for those types of features in some of the photos that I'm gonna be showing and also later on, uh, if we get to look through Martin's telescope tonight. Another thing I want to call your attention to are what are called the seas or mares on the moon. These are these dark gray, very smooth, they appear to be very smooth kind of patches on the moon that form the man in the moon or the Mickey Mouse in the moon or the rabbit in the moon, depends on what you want to see when you kind of look up at the moon more towards full. Um, those are large basalt plains uh, on the surface of the moon. Basalt is a form of uh, volcanic rock uh, that we have. The Hawaiian islands, islands, for example, are made of basaltic lava. Very, very similar composition to uh, the seas, what are called the seas on the moon. Um, these are actually the remnants of enormous impact craters. So giant asteroids slammed into the moon to carve out these big basins. And these filled in with molten rock um, that essentially welled back up after that impact and filled in and made the smooth floor uh, of these seas. So keep an eye out for those. And we'll talk a little bit about more about those as we move on as well. And again, down in the Southern Highlands, down in the South, we have this very old, very cratered, heavily cratered terrain. Uh, it is higher topographically than the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Um, and it's heavily, heavily cratered. It's an ancient, very old, old terrain. We're gonna do a little close up flyover of that area uh, in just a little while. So remember the Southern Highlands, very interesting, very dynamic and complex landscape on the moon. If you have a very good pair of binoculars, you can look up at the moon and see some of these features, uh, no trouble. If you have good you know, seven by 50 uh, birding binoculars or 10 by 50s, um, turn them on the moon one evening on a phase like this and you can see some of these structures. So I'm gonna take us on a little bit of a tour through some of the phases. So we're just on that 4.7 day old moon, beautiful crescent. And we're going a little bit further along to the eight day old moon. And this is actually just about the phase that we're at tonight. So if we do get the opportunity to look through Martin's telescope tonight, we're gonna be able to see the moon almost exactly like this. Um, this was a photo I took on the moon about a year ago uh, when it was at this beautiful phase. And you see some of these structures that we were just talking about. You see the seas or the mares that are these basalt plains, the remnants of massive impact craters that filled back in with upwelling basaltic lava. Um, you see very light marks with streaks. These are actually young impact craters, younger impact craters on the moon. And these white streaks are rays of ejecta that got thrown out of the uh, impact site um, when the um, asteroid hit and sprayed across the surface of the moon. So anywhere you see one of these light areas and these sprays, that's where an, an, um, an asteroid impacted the moon, uh, relatively speaking recently, could be within the last 100 million years or so. Uh, in comparison, the Southern Highlands, remember this very high, very rough part of the moon in the Southern Hemisphere, notice how heavily cratered it is. There are craters on top of craters on top of craters. And in geology, when you see a landscape like that, that generally means it's very old. If you have lots of craters, particularly if we're looking at in astronomical contexts, even on other planets or moons around other planets, when you see a very heavily cratered surface with impact on top of impact, you know you're looking at a pretty old surface relative to these, for example, that are much smoother. They haven't had that much uh, impact activity. Yes. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mark, do you, do uh, Lawrence. Do you have time? Do you have a question? Absolutely. Question. Go ahead. Yes. 
as shown on this slide here, it says eight day year old moon. And we have one person uh, who's joining us tonight would like to know what you mean by four day old moon and eight day old moon. Sure, that's a really good question. So the moon goes through its cycle of phases a little bit over 29 days. I think it's 29.4 or 29.6 days. So new moon, when we actually don't see the moon, it's actually um, just dark. There's no moon in the sky, essentially, is you can think of as day zero. Um, and over time, you get this thin crescent beginning to show. And day after day, you get more and more of a crescent. And you saw, if you remember on the 4.7 day old moon, it was a much stronger crescent, not as much of the moon was illuminated. And as you go over time, more and more of the moon is illuminated as it goes in its orbit around the sun, around, not around the sun, around the, uh, the earth. And the angle of the moon relative to the sunlight falling on it is changing uh, throughout that 29 and a half day cycle. And over time, it's getting more and more illuminated to where we get to full moon, right? In full moon, the sun is setting and the moon is rising and the sun is essentially illuminating the full disk of the moon that's facing us. And then after full moon, um, more and more days go on, the crescent begins to show again as more as less and less of the moon is illuminated until we get to new moon again. So it's a 29 and a little over a half day cycle that we go through. So amateur astronomers and others refer to the age of the moon to get a sense of where it is in that cycle and what kind of crescent you might see. And also what kind of features are going to be illuminated along the terminator, that really interesting part. Uh, of the um, illuminated part of the moon here where all that interesting action is. So a great question, really, really good question. Um, tonight is called the first quarter moon and it's a little past um, seven days, 7.8 days old, I think tonight. Um, and it is 54 and a half percent illuminated. You might hear folks refer to the percent of illumination of the moon as opposed to how many days old it is. That's a similar kind of reference. Um, if it was fully illuminated 100%, that would be full moon. So what we're seeing on the first quarter moon, it's a little over half illuminated, at least tonight. Really, really good question. So here on the left, you, uh, I have kind of a wide field image of the moon that shows its entire face. And up here, I took a series of two photographs and stitched them together into a mosaic, this high magnification mosaic, to give you a sense of what can you see through a telescope at fairly high magnification of the moon's surface. And you can see a bunch. Um, the cool thing about it is the moon's always changing, right, as it goes through its, its uh, monthly cycle. And you get to see different parts of it re revealed in different lengths of shadows, um, different structures appear. It's really an, an endlessly dynamic object. It's it, it just, I never get tired of looking at it through a telescope. And here you can see in this um, kind of northern quadrant of the moon where we're looking are the Apennine Mountains. This mountain range was actually uplifted when this basin, so this is one of those seas, a big impact basin that a giant asteroid carved out. This, these mountains were uplifted as a result of that impact. So they got pushed up because this impactor slammed into the moon. Uh, the Imbrian Basin, by the way, I think is nearly 700 plus miles across. So it's an enormous impact basin. To give you a sense of scale, Texas, the state of Texas is about 750 miles by 750 miles. So that's the kind of scale we're talking about here. And these mountains were shoved up along the edge as a result of that impact. Um, they're really beautiful. And in this notch right here, you can see this is where Apollo 15 landed. It landed right next to the Apennine Mountains. It was a geologically interesting area. That's why they targeted that location for the Apollo, uh, one of the Apollo landings. You can see beautiful craters. And if you notice in the floor of this crater, look at the shadow. Because remember, we're along the Terminator, so it's like dawn. So you have really long shadows um, going away from the direction that the sunlight is coming. So here is the uh, eastern rim of Archimedes, this crater. And this shadow shows the topography, the ups and downs of the rim of that crater, just like you'd see of, uh, a hill here on Earth. You can see in the shadow what that shape of that hill looks like. So look in the floors of craters to get interesting details in those, from those shadows of what the um, edge of that crater, what that rim looks like. 
Um, another thing I want to call your attention to is our Stillus crater here. Um, this crater is really beautiful. It's got a strong ring, a uh, strong rim. It also has what's called a debris apron. So when the asteroid that formed this crater smacked into the moon, um, a whole bunch of debris was ejected from it. And a lot of it actually fell very, very close to the, to the rim of the crater and made this what's called an apron of debris. And then there are also some rays going away from it where some of the ejected material went further away and then arced down uh, to the ground to the lunar surface afterwards. Another feature of a lot of craters are these central peaks. Uh, think about a milk drop going into your uh, uh, a cup of milk. Um, the crater that's formed when the milk drop hits has a rim, a ring that's ejected. And there's a rebound from the center because it punches a little hole into the surface of the liquid and then it rebounds back up. The same thing happens with rock. So when an asteroid hits the moon, punches a big hole, melts a whole bunch of rock around it, and there's a rebound effect that generally often will create what's called a central peak or even a complex of central peaks in the center of a crater. So keep an eye out for those too when we're flying over the moon's surface in just a little while. Um, this valley, the Alpine Valley, is a very prominent um, uh, structure that you can see on the moon with a small telescope. It'd be a reach to see it with binoculars. Uh, but this whole area at um, first quarter moon is really, really interesting to look at. Very exciting and dynamic area. So what I want to do now is do this little flyover. It's a short video, a little over four minutes. And we're going to fly along the Terminator, along the boundary between the illuminated side and the shadowed side of the moon. And look at all this interesting topography and all these interesting structures that are visible um, on its surface as we do that. And as we kind of fly along, I'll be kind of talking about what we're seeing and also some of the interesting effects. So we're starting in the Southern Highlands. Uh, this crater complex right here is called Clavius Crater. And it has a lot of small craters in its floor. Um, notice again with Clavius, uh, you have the shadowed side here. The opposite side is illuminated, a little bit even into the darkness and the other side of the Terminator here. Um, this beautiful crater is called Tycho. Uh, Tycho Crater is... Um, pretty deep, almost three miles deep, uh, which is pretty remarkable, and about 36 miles across. It has a very prominent central peak. Remember I mentioned that rebound where the molten rock bounces back up and then cools very rapidly, and it leaves a mountain in the center of this very deep crater. So the sunlight's coming from this direction. Uh, we have the crater rim, the shadowed inside part of that crater rim, we have the peak of the central peak illuminated in Tycho. And then look, there's the shadow of the central peak on the floor of the crater itself. Then you have the illuminated uh, western side and then shadows beyond. So it's really interesting to look along the Terminator to see what kind of structures and details you can pull out. There's also interesting rim right here of this crater. And then you can see the shadow that shows you what the edge of that crater looks like. Uh, in profile. So we're going to keep fl our flying going on. You may notice the shimmering of the image uh, in the video here. That shimmering is due to atmospheric turbulence. In amateur astronomy, we call that um, seeing. If the seeing is good, that, that turbulence is very, very minimal, and you can resolve very, very small craters and things like that on the surface of the moon. This night that I shot this video actually was pretty good seeing. I would say this is better than average. Um, very bad seeing. Uh, you can't look at the moon through high magnification because it just kind of looks like a mess. It's out of focus. Uh, you can't see much structure. It's really not very interesting. So seeing that atmospheric turbulence is really important in amateur astronomy and photography, but also when you're looking at, um, at the moon, uh, you want the atmosphere to be very calm, very stable, so you can resolve the smallest possible objects you can. We've just moved to a really fun part of the moon here, um, of the first quarter moon. Um, there's a, whoops, I just jumped to the wrong place. Let's go back here. I want to pause it here. Going to wait for that to, uh, there we go. I want you to notice this structure right here. This is called the straight wall on the moon. It's actually a big fault escarpment. 
There we go, that's a little bit better image of it. Right here, see the straight line? Um, this is 60 miles long to give you a sense of the scale. So a little bit less than the distance between Madison and Milwaukee, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Southern Wisconsin's uh, geography. Um, so you could put Madison right here and Milwaukee would be right about there uh, on this particular structure. Um, the straight wall is, uh, you can think of it as a cliff, but it's not that steep. It's actually a fairly shallow, um, has a, a fairly shallow relief. It's a mile wide in its width. So it's not a super steep cliff, but it is a very straight fault escarpment where um, essentially the, the ground um, broke just like in an earthquake, except it would have been a moonquake. Uh, and you have an uplift block and a block that was down relative to that block that went up. So this is the really interesting geologic feature on the moon, the straight wall that's visible um, in the waxing moon when the moon is getting brighter and brighter towards full. And it also is illuminated during the waning moon. So if you get up early in the morning hours and look at it when this is illuminated, it appears as a bright line rather than a shadowed line. So again, the moon is always changing. Whenever you look at it, you get to see different things and can pick out different details and objects. So um, the video is gonna kind of move along, gonna continue north along the Terminator. And notice, see that little point of light right there across the Terminator, that's a peak, another mountain peak. There are some more peaks. We have illuminated crater rims. The smallest crater you can possibly see, see how this one is going in and out of focus because of the turbulence of the atmosphere? The ones that appear that we can barely make out are probably on the order of half a mile to a mile wide, just to give you a sense of the smallest things that we can discern in this video, this high magnification video. We're hoping that tonight um, we can actually do this for you live uh, with Martin down in Kansas. If uh, the weather down there complies, uh, we'd be able to have, um, you know, a really, really beautiful image and kind of flyover of, um, of the moon at almost the same phase. It'll be just about this phase. Um, so here we are back in the video. I wanted to call your attention to this area right here. Notice how dark it is. This is actually um, a volcanic deposit, a volcanic basalt uh, deposit on the moon. And there's a dome right here, probably a little hard to discern um, on your screens, but there's a volcanic structure that you can actually see here on the moon. And there are a number of these domes across the surface that at different uh, times in the moon's uh, cycle, monthly cycle, they're illuminated just right. So you can actually see this little dome on the surface of the moon. And those are actually volcanic structures, um, not created by an impact, but by volcanism uh, on the moon. I'm gonna keep flying along here. And Jeff, yeah, we got about one minute left. It's okay. just a little bit of time. Great yeah. presentation. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video and um, move toward, uh, Oops, screen sharing is stopped. Move toward um, showing you the um, kind of last shot that I want to give you tonight. I'll get my screen sharing going one more time. PowerPoint, there we go. We're going to move on to um, some crater details just to give you a sense of the variation in the types of craters you can see. Remember that crater apron, all that debris that kind of got tossed out of the crater when the impact hit. This particular crater, Kepler, 20 miles across, has a beautiful crater apron and rays emanating away from it from debris that got thrown out even further than that apron. So lots of interesting details and structures. And again, a little later, 11.5 day old moon, we're getting heading toward full moon. All sorts of interesting structures come out um, on the surface of the moon, including bright young impact craters like Tycho here. It's only about 100 million years old. So relatively speaking, that's a new crater on the moon. Lots of the craters in the Southern Highlands along here um, were formed two and a half billion years ago, not million, but billion years ago. So it's a much more ancient, older surface uh, that you see in the Southern Highlands of the moon. Uh, looking along the limb of the moon, you see really interesting uh, craters that kind of 
appear edge on, you can get more interesting structures. These brighter ones, again, are younger and they have those beautiful rays emanating away from them. And then finally, just to give you another sense of scale here in the Southern Highlands, Chicard Crater is one of my favorites. Why? Because it fits really well into the geography of the upper Midwest. Chicard Crater is about 135 miles across. Um, put Madison here, put Chicago here. That gives you a sense of the size of these craters on the moon. They're really large and they represent events that were extremely energetic, really, really uh, devastating, huge impacts. Uh, on the moon during the period of heavy bombardment over two and a half billion years ago. If we're lucky tonight, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see about the seven and a half, 7.9 day old moon uh, through Martin's telescope. And uh, keep your fingers crossed, then in about an hour, we'll have an opportunity to do that. Thanks everyone for listening and I hope you learned a little bit of something tonight. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. That was, I think I learned something myself. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your enthusiasm for the moon tonight. My pleasure. Are you want to take some questions? I see there were yeah, two we questions. Yeah, we do have, hey, Jeff, do you have, do you want to take a couple of questions? We, I think we have a little time. Yeah, um, I'd be glad to. <laughs> yeah, Teresa is wondering why some craters have debris and others don't. Really good question. So a um, couple of things can influence that. One is the nature of the impactor itself. So we just learned, I don't know if you've heard the news, that NASA actually had a, a spacecraft touch an asteroid, asteroid Bennu. Bennu is an asteroid, it's really big. It's bigger than the Empire State Building, but it's essentially a rubble pile. It's very, very loose aggregate of rock and, and gravel and things like that. Other asteroids are like solid iron and nickel. So the nature of the impactor can determine kind of what effect it has when it impacts the surface of the moon. Another really big uh, factor is what angle does the asteroid hit the surface at? Does it come straight down, punch a big deep hole? Does it come in obliquely, kind of almost skip off the surface, you know, coming in at a really, really shallow angle? All of those things can affect um, what the nature of the resulting crater looks like, whether or not it has a central peak, um, what the debris apron or even rays might look like. And another kind of major factor that would influence uh, that would be the, the nature of the rock that it's hitting. So what part of the moon is it hitting? Is it hitting the um, um, silica rich rocks of the Southern Highlands or is it impacting one of those basalt plains of the seas? All of those factors can kind of come into play of, uh, to determine the resulting, the nature of that crater. What does that look like uh, after the impact and after all that rock has cooled? It's a great question, complex answer, but a great question. And also here's another question from, mm -hmm. from Ezra, who's five years old. Uh, Ezra wonders how the moon was created. Really good question, Ezra. So we're learning a lot more about that right now. And it's another reason we want to go back and visit the moon again is to make to confirm some of our theories about that. The best models that we have now suggest that um, a planet, a planetary body the size of Mars, which is half the size of the Earth, very early in the Earth's um, history, so probably 4.2 billion years ago, um, so not long after the Earth formed, we got hit by another kind of planetary body that was forming in our solar system that was the size of Mars. And in that impact, it was a glancing blow. It actually knocked off some of the um, crustal uh, material that was forming and a little bit down into the mantle, a little down uh, in under the surface of the Earth and knocked a bunch of our planet off into space, essentially. That material eventually coalesced into our moon. So the geologic minerals that make up our moon are very, very similar to the minerals that make the composition of the surface of our Earth. So we've often wondered why are those two things so similar? It's likely because the moon is made of a large piece of the kind of outer skin of our, of our planet because of this impact that occurred really early in the history of our planet. So great question. Right now, that's our best understanding of what likely occurred to form our moon. Uh, just a sidebar note, the moon is moving away from our planet at about three centimeters a year. So back when the dinosaurs were here 67 million years ago and earlier, the moon was closer. It would have been bigger in our sky and closer and closer and closer uh, the further back in time you go. So it's interesting to think that it's actually slowly moving away from us um, over geologic time. 
Jeff and Lawrence. Thank you so much. That was My so educational and so interesting. <laughs>